welcome to uh, our second uh, Tech Tech NCI's 21, 2021 Tech Tech webinar series. It's great to have you here uh, today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the lands of the Ngunnawal people, uh, who are the, uh, the local Indigenous uh, people of the ACT region. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all at work, you are all coming from us today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. Uh, pay my, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands in Australia. So what is Tech Take? Well, Tech Take was uh, put together by the NCI communications and NCI training team to increase the awareness of the utilization of the cutting edge technology of HPC data science, AI and cloud computing. Speakers will demonstrate how their advanced research makes good use of NCI's resources and services effectively and efficiently. Uh, invite, we'll be inviting prestigious national and international researchers, industrial leaders and technical pioneers to share the latest technology of HPC and applications, and that's who we'll be hearing from today, actually. Uh, mark the date uh, in your calendars. We are usually coming to you, coming to you on the last Tuesday at 11 a.m. Australian Eastern, Eastern Standard Time uh, each month. Uh, today, obviously, that is not the case uh, because we have our international guest speaker today. Uh, we've made a slight change to the schedule. Uh, speaking of our guests today, we're, we'll be talking with uh, Dr. Peter Dubin, who's the coordinator of machine learning and AI activities at ECMWF, uh, which is the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Uh, Peter is a Royal Society University Research Fellow in the Research Department of ECMWF. He has prof professional interest in high resolution weather and climate simulations, high performance computing for weather and climate models, and machine learning for weather and climate predictions. So, uh, we'll go ahead and start the tech tech here. Uh, you might be able to see Peter there just in the, in the uh, little Zoom window. Uh, we're going to kick off with a recording uh, that Peter has put together for us uh, regarding, his, uh, re regarding his work, uh, which will run for about 30 minutes. During that time, if you have any questions uh, for Peter uh, or for the NCI communications team, uh, I should have introduced myself from the beginning. My name is Chris Wilkinson. I'm on the NCI communications team. If you have any questions for uh, Peter, myself, or anyone, uh, please just drop into the Q&A on your Zoom window there. Uh, if there's any other comments you want to make, just use the chat window there as well. Uh, Peter, we'll, we'll be doing a 30-minute Q&A following the recording live with Peter as well. So if you'd rather ask a question in person to Peter, uh, we'll have that ability as well. Uh, just using the raise hand functionality. You can see probably see my hand raised there in Zoom. So you just click the raise hand, lower hand button. Uh, but for now, I'll watch the recording. If there's any questions, like I said, just drop them in the Q&A. Uh, without any further delay, let's get started. And hopefully everyone can see that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Duben, and I'm going to talk about the next decade of machine learning at Eastern WF, and I will give an introduction to this machine learning roadmap. And I am the AI and machine learning coordinator at Eastern WF. And before I'm going to talk about machine learning in particular, I'm just going to talk briefly about Eastern WF. So we are the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, and we are a research institute, but we're also a 24-7 operational weather service for medium range monthly and seasonal forecasts and we are an independent intergovernmental organization supported by the 34 member states that you see on the map on the right we're based in reading but um, we are also now going to have another facility in bologna and in bonn and as we do operational weather predictions we have two supercomputers on site and we're also the home of the so-called integrated forecast system which is one of the leading global weather prediction systems of the world so Let's go to machine learning. Why? Um, are, what is actually machine learning? So in principle, machine learning are computer algorithms that improve automatically through learning from data without being explicitly programmed. So that's kind of the general introduction. And there are two different classes of machine learning algorithms um, that are building the most important parts of machine learning. One of them is what we call supervised learning. And here you basically learn a non-linear mapping between different fields. So you have input data, you have output data, you have a loss function, and then you basically learn the mapping between the input and the output data. And this can be done in a very complex way with very complex um, tools. And the other option is um, the so-called unsupervised learning. And what you do here is that you kind of generate a lot of data 
and then you try to kind of um, develop or understand some structure within this data using what we called unsupervised learning. Um, why should we look into this in principle and why now? Um, so on the, and the figure on the right is showing um, the, the different supercomputers that we worked with at ESNWF um, in the last couple of decades. So the x-axis is time here in years and the y-axis is the sustained um, performance and teraflops that we had at ESNWF on site and the different boxes are the different computers. And what you see is basically the orange line here is a high performance computer growth, which is a linear line over time in this plot. And this plot is logarithmic, so therefore it's an exponential law, and that's nothing else but Moore's law. But there's also the blue line of the data archive at ESNWF, and you will see that it's also roughly linear. So there has been an exponential increase of data volume at ESNWF. And um, we need to kind of make sure that we can somehow handle this data in the future as well. And therefore machine learning as a tool to actually extract information from data and to learn something from data is very important. But also there has been an enormous increase in knowledge of how we do machine learning. So uh, about something like 100 papers per day published on machine learning. So we have an enormous increase of our knowledge how we actually build the perfect machine learning tools for specific applications. And therefore also machine learning is playing a, a more and more important role in the future. However, there have also been a, a, a significant um, increase in the availability of supercomputing hardware for machine learning. So this um, slide, I've, I've, I've stolen this slide here from Thorsten Höffler, where he tried to collect all the different companies that are involved in developing hardware for machine learning. And you will see that there are many, and it's actually a developing slide. So whenever Thorsten is showing this slide, there's at least one more, more new icon on the slide. So basically, this means that this multi-billion dollar industry of hardware development for machine learning will have a very strong impact on high performance computing in the future and actually already today. And also, um, there, is a, there are a lot of machine learning software tools available that actually allow um, you, even if you don't have any idea about machine learning in principle, um, you could really build um, very effective and very efficient machine learning tools that are quite complex based on a couple of hundred lines of Python code. So basically, there's also the software framework around that really um, is required to make um, fast developments. So that's in general about machine learning. Probably most of you have um, known most of this already. But what is actually um, the interest to perform machine learning for weather predictions and also climate predictions in principle? So let's, uh, let's see what the difficult part is about weather and climate predictions. And I'd like to show this figure here, which is one of the pictures from one of the Apollo missions. And you see the Earth, and you see the, all the problems that, are, that we have when we want to basically simulate um, the Earth for weather and climate. One problem is um, that you basically have a very complex system with a lot of different components like um, sea ice, land ice, cloud physics, um, atmospheric chemistry, land surface, atmosphere itself, ocean itself, interacting with each other. So there are a lot of different components, and this means that our models have to be very complex with something like a million lines of, of, of model code, basically, to represent all this complexity. But also the different components follow typically nonlinear differential equations and show chaotic dynamics, and therefore it's very tricky actually to kind of simulate those things with a computer because you have exponential growth of errors. And to make the things even worse, the Earth is very big as well. It's huge, basically. So um, this means that even with the fastest supercomputers, we are not able to run um, models of atmosphere and ocean, for example, with higher resolution than something like 10 kilometers of, um, for, for global weather and climate predictions. And this means that we have to truncate those scales. And as you truncate, we're basically going to lose information. And um, we need to represent those subgrid scale features one way or the other in the system because we have a multi-scale system. So it's just a very difficult beast. Um, to simulate the Earth system. On the other hand, we have an enormous amount of data available. So if you think about um, the data that we have, we do not only have observations from various different sources, but we also have a lot of model data available. So we're talking about hundreds of petabytes of data that we store at ESNWF, for example, that are related one way or the other to the Earth system. And if you put those two points together, you have a, um, a very difficult system to, to work with. And on the other hand, you have a lot of data then it's quite clear that if you had a tool that could actually learn nonlinear com complex dynamics from data, this tool would be very useful. And this tool is machine learning. So basically, there are many application areas for machine learning throughout the entire workflow of numerical weather predictions, where we think that machine learning could really make a difference. And on the other hand, also, as I told you before, uh, machine learning also provides a number of opportunities for high performance computing. And even if you're not interested in machine learning whatsoever, you should still be interested in what machine learning is doing at the moment to the hardware, which is available for the future. So even um, if you're not interested in, in deep learning, for example, you should still think 
how you could use high performance computing um, hardware, which is de um, developed for deep learning in particular for conventional tools. Okay, um, so why is it actually also timely to look into machine learning right now? Um, there are two things going on here. <laughs> the first of the thing is in Europe, um, is, is a project which is called Destination Earth. And Destination Earth is basically, the aim of this project is to build what we call digital twins of the Earth. So you basically try to generate a very digital representation of the Earth system. And if I um, show you this plot here, it's basically very similar to the, to, the, um, to the plot that I've shown you earlier. But what you see in here is basically on the one side a model simulation and on the other one a satellite observations. And basically you will see that they are very similar. So we're talking about a, a level of details in those models that you can literally talk about a digital twin, a digital representation of the Earth. And on the other hand, we have what we call the digital revolution of Earth system sciences, um, as kind of explained in this um, article on the right. What this basically means is um, our models have evolved over decades and they've grown and grown in complexity. And it's now very difficult actually to port those models, for example, to GPU hardware and also other hardware which is going to be there in terms of in a time where we really have to, to be able to kind of and port the same model codes to very different hardware components, which we call heterogeneous hardware infrastructure. And this is quite tricky. And therefore, we basically need uh, something like a revolution, actually, to make our models fit to actually run on different hardware and run efficiently on this hardware. And machine learning fits in quite well. So if you talk about the details of this digital revolution, um, I've just reproduced the plots um, from this paper. We have individual components that will help us to tackle this challenge of um, the digital revolutions, and one of them is machine learning here in red. And if you now think about how the different components should progress the state of the art, which is in the, mid in the center of this figure. And as you go to the outside towards those different angles, you will basically increase the state of the art um, towards, for example, code portability, system resilience, and so on and so forth. And where we really think machine learning is going to make a difference is code portability, um, time and energy solution, and earth system complexity. Um, so we really kind of, the machine learning will really bring something to the table here and make a difference. So the big question right now is basically what will machine learning look like in 10 years from now? How strong is going, the impact of machine learning going to be um, on the state of the art uh, if we kind of just look into the future for 10 years? And I like to show the scale here. So on the left is the scale you basically have um, that machine learning will have no long-term effect whatsoever. It's basically just a wave passing through and we will, we will not really make, uh, change the state of the art much um, with machine learning. And on the right side of the scale, basically we have the opposite, which means that machine learning will actually replace most conventional models and we will do more or less nothing else in machine learning in, in the first place. And the question is like, where are we on the scale? Are we going to be on the left side or are we going to be in the right side? And basically, um, the, 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 this is still up for discussion. So we really don't know exactly where we're going to be. The uncertainty to answer this question is very large. So let's just assume that we're going to be on the very right side of the scale and that machine learning is going to, to basically replace everything else. Um, so what would this world look like? So let's test this. Um, let's answer the question whether we can replace conventional weather forecast systems by deep learning entirely. So in principle, you can base the entire model on, on deep learning and neural networks and, base, and, and trust the conventional tools. Basically, I told you before that it's very difficult to design those models in the first place. And also I told you that we have hundreds of petabytes of data. So there's enough data available. So what we've done here in a toy model experience um, already two years ago now is that we retrieved um, so-called reanalysis data. And that's basically data that is giving you the state of the atmosphere for a couple of decades. And um, we, you get this data as global data sets and you can basically get it in hourly resolution. So you have now um, over the last couple of decades um, data for one two dimensional field, so-called geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. And you have this from one hour to the next. And what you can do now is you can basically learn a stencil um, operation um, and, and pass the stencil throughout the grid. And you can basically update the grid point in the middle and you learn using deep learning to predict uh, to, to, to propagate this, this field from one hour to the next. And once you've done this, you can basically screen through the entire grid and you can upstate, update your state vector and you have literally build a forecast model just based on deep learning. There's no physical understanding required here whatsoever. So let's see how, how far we can go with such a tool. And it turns out um, that this is actually working quite well. So um, the two that you see here, one of them is showing you the truth data, so what, how the atmosphere actually progressed in time, and the other one is showing you the neural network prediction. And even the expert couldn't tell you which one of those two is which. 
So it's literally um, that the, the neural network picked up the dynamics very nicely. Then the next question is a forecast error. So on this plot on the right, you basically see the forecast error on the y-axis and you see the time of days on the x-axis for a five-day weather prediction. And what you should see is that um, basically the, the black line here is a neural network forecast error and the blue line is a very, very, very coarse resolution um, conventional tool. And what you should see is that basically both of those models are fairly similar in terms of the quality. So it's not that one is much, much better than the other, but they are kind of comparable in terms of the complexity. They're both far, far away from the operational weather predictions, which is the magenta line here. So it's not that this could compete with what we're actually doing right now in operational predictions, but it's still impressive how good the neural network in principle is. There's also a lot of progress at the moment. So this black line from our example is kind of has been brought down quite significantly by, by further studies that used much better data sets and also much better neural network prediction predictors. So there's also scope of improving this um, further. And the question is now whether this is actually the future for medium range weather predictions, for example. And the answer, at least my personal answer to this question is that it's very unlikely for a couple of reasons. One of them is, um, that um, our model simulations, for example, they just crash if you run, run, run them for long enough because we haven't told the system anything about momentum or conservation, energy conservation, anything like this. So therefore, the, the system doesn't really um, progress well in a physical sense. So that's problem number two. Uh, number one, problem number two is also we wouldn't even know how to increase complexity to the level that is required to beat operational predictions. So if you want to get into the range of the magenta line here, you would need billions of degrees of freedoms and we don't know how to train the networks to do something like this. And the third reason is also, um, even though we have a lot of data in terms of volume, we only have something like 40 years of independent weather situations from satellite data. So it's not that we can actually train very complex systems because we have only a limited amount of, of um, independent weather situations that we can train from. So there are a couple of problems. Um, and also, I just want to make the point here, it's difficult to beat conventional systems right now because the conventional systems are actually quite amazing. So we're talking about global models that have billions of degrees of freedoms running at extremely high resolution, having an extremely good feature richness in comparison to the truth. So in this example here, you have again a satellite observation on one side and a model simulation on the other one. I'm not going to tell you which one is which and you basically see that the feature richness is amazing and the realistic uh, and, and it's, it's extremely realistic those simulations. However, um, there is potential for machine learning tools to beat conventional Earth system models. For example, if you think about very short term predictions, if you just predict one hour into the future, and what would be called now casting, um, the situation is quite different because then conservation, probably, for example, is not really important. You have more independent weather situations because um, you, you basically just look into a very local situation and then you can train much better systems in, com in comparison. And for example, there's a, an approach by Google here where they really show some amazing results for now casting applications and there's more to come. And on the other hand, if you think about very long term predictions like seasons into the future, for example, the, the, the situation is also different because then it's more like a statistical problem. It's more like a statistic problem that you can really um, train for specific cost functions rather than representing a physical f a system in all its beauty and details. And there's a paper by Hamad Al, for example, who show that for multi-year interval forecasts or very large scale multi-year forecasts, you can actually beat conventional systems again. And the big question is now also what's happening for climate change. So if you have climate change, this is in principle, again, good on the statistical sides, but on the other hand, actually, um, you train from data sets that are and from data of the climate today. And if you look into the future, the climate is going to change. So what does this actually mean to your reliability of the machine learning tool? It's a good question. So I told you that medium range weather predictions are probably not going to change significantly in terms of the all in approach that you basically replace the entire forecast by machine learning. However, what happens if you actually look into the workflow? And this is a figure that is showing you the workflow of um, operational weather predictions from observations to data simulation to numerical weather forecasts and then to post processing. Um, and underlying there is this high performance and big data infrastructure, which is basically driving the entire systems. And I've asked around where people at ECNWF think that machine learning could maybe make a difference. And we came up with this plot here that is basically showing you um, above and below the workflow, the different boxes and the boxes are color coded in the same way as the different workflow components. And what you see is there are many of those boxes, um, which means that there are many application areas for machine learning. 
um, where machine learning could maybe make a difference, but also they're spread over the entire workflow because the, the boxes are also very colorful. So in principle, right now we are at a stage where we really need to understand where machine learning will make a difference and how machine learning tools um, can make a difference for those different application areas. And as this is kind of quite complex, so you basically have um, all the different components over the workflow. You have a lot of different people and a lot of different departments involved um, who want to try out machine learning. We published recently the so-called machine learning roadmap for ECNWF, where we try to kind of centralize all the different approaches and we kind of try to kind of identify the biggest challenges that we ha have ahead of us and um, to basically make sure that we um, that we kind of build the best possible infrastructure in terms of both software and hardware um, for our users and ourselves as well. So we have a timeline in here. I'm not going to go into the milestones in detail on this slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the challenges that we've identified and then I'm going to talk you through the milestones that we've defined to tackle those challenges. So these are the challenges milestones now. Um, the, the first challenge is that basically Domain scientists often have a very different, different philosophy to machine learning scientists. So domain scientists like to think about physical systems and physical reasoning, and machine learning scientists think about input data, output data, loss functions to basically improve a specific problem for a specific cost function. And that's often doesn't really go very well together. So it often requires really domain scientists and machine learning scientists to, to work um, very tightly together to be successful in, in those domain specific problems. And therefore, we want to support very close collaborations between machine learning scientists and domain scientists, but also we want to approach appro approaches like explainable AI, trustworthy AI, and physics-informed machine learning, where you basically learn how to project knowledge about the physical systems into the machine learning solutions. And some milestones to actually achieve this, one of them is that we want to kind of establish a community for machine learning and earth system sciences and a network and to update our roadmap from time to time to kind of um, make sure that we are going into the right direction. And we also want to make um, uh, develop a, so a first machine learning training course, which is actually dedicated to the needs of our community. The next challenge is um, that we basically have many applications um, where off the shelf machine learning tools are not really going to work. So if you just take image recognition tools and apply it to a physical system, often you don't really get very good results. And therefore we, often, we need to basically foster cross dissimilarity collaborations again, and really develop customized machine learning tools for our specific needs. And this often requires um, to develop what we call benchmark data sets. So the idea here is to basically have a specific problems, for example, the deep learning of unstructured grids, um, on unstructured grids on the sphere. And then you basically develop one data set that can be used to basically compare qualitatively and quantitatively different machine learning solutions um, to each other. And some approaches here, one of them is that we want to have one machine learning conference per year at Eastern WF, and we also and they want to develop at least four machine learning benchmark data sets until the end of 2022. The next challenge is um, that it's often difficult to learn from observations to improve your models. Um, so often observations and models are very much independent from each other. And this doesn't help if you actually want to kind of really learn something from observations for your models. And the, the trick here is to really look into data simulation where you bring models and data and from observations very close together and then actually kind of be compared. And also we want to learn boundary conditions from observations um, that could be useful. Um, one milestone here is that we want to look into what we call Internet of Things data. So for example, like really massively streams of data from, from users um, all over the place, but also from mobile phones and other things. There's a lot of data around that could potentially be also very useful for weather predictions, but we have to tap into this and actually learn how to use it using machine learning. The next one is a data avalanche. Um, so basically, um, Machine learning users are very data greedy. They want to have a lot of data, and this is putting quite a lot of pressure on our data retrieval systems. And the, the trick here is to anticipate the data access um, that machine learning users may have and channelize requests, and again, develop benchmark data sets that could satisfy more than one user, but also um, really make use of efficient um, hardware um, in, in terms of the, the data structure and data retrieval. And the trick here is that we basically want to include machine learning also in our HPC procurement um, in the future so that we can actually um, really understand the needs for our hardware towards um, the needs for machine learning from our hardware. Then also often um, domain scientists are working with Fortran and CPUs, so with different tools and machine learning scientists would typically work on Python and GPUs and to actually bring the, the two, two sides into one level, you really need a lot of training 
and also to provide software and hardware for machine learners um, at ECNWF and elsewhere um, to make them actually work successfully. And here um, we want to basically achieve a comprehensive, well-documented machine learning workflow in place um, by, um, by 2023. And also we are developing Jupyter Hubs and machine learning libraries, for example, um, to actually help the user. And well, um, sufficient hardware needs to be available and we're very, on a very good track to actually make, for example, a lot of GPU hardware available at ESNWF. And there's also going to be Copernicus ITTs involved for machine learning um, that to also kind of um, strengthen our climate services teams regarding machine learning applications. So the last one is to integrate machine learning tools into the conventional NWP and climate services workflow. What this means is we also need to learn how to actually make use of machine learning um, tools within our normal standard workflow. And this is actually more tricky than you may think. Um, and therefore this will require some centralized tools and efforts to actually, for example, understand how you can um, efficiently use deep learning tools within our Fortran IFS models. And also those, uh, those efforts should be embedded within the scalability project to really make sure that if we kind of port our conventional tools to GPUs, um, we also will be able to, um, to in the same framework and the same time frame also make use of machine learning tools on the GPUs. So the machine learning team, th there will be a machine learning team at ESNWF established within the next year or within this year actually. And there's also going to be at least five machine learning applications um, integrated into the operational workflow by 2023. Okay, these are the challenges and milestones. Um, you can see again here um, in all its beauty that there's um, basically a timeline to it as well. And there's also a vision for um, machine learning towards 2030, um, 2031. I'm not going to go into detail here, but please have a look at the machine learning roadmap yourself if you want to read more. There's also going to be um, a project that we call Milestrom, the Machine Learning for Scalable Meteorology and Climate which is a European Union project and with um, seven fantastic partners. And here we also want to do what we call a co-design cycle. So we basically want to develop specific machine learning applications for the domain of weather and climate. We want to build work and machine learning workflow software as well. Um, and then we also want to kind of be, develop specific hardware components um, that are capable of running efficiently those machine learning tools for weather and climate on future hardware. And we will have different br um, products as well um, for example, benchmark data sets, machine learning solutions, and the workflow tool as such, but also compute system designs to really make the best out of machine learning for weather and climate. Um, I've planned to go into the details of a lot of applications now, but I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just briefly explain you really what we're doing at ESNWF, and then you can basically go into detail. Or you can send me an email and I'm going to tell you more about um, the details of the different projects. One project is to look into so-called bias correction. But we basically, um, what we do is we have a very complex um, data simulation framework that we call 4 var And there you basically have the trajectory and the observations very close together. And what you can do is you can basically um, run the model forward for a couple of hours and then compare against the change of the observations. And you can do this in a way that you can actually try to learn the error of the model for short-term forecasts. And once you've learned the error, you can actually correct for the error in the forecast. So that's one way where we can really bring bring together observations and models very efficiently with machine learning. Another way is to basically um, parameterize, uh, emulate different parameterization schemes. So the idea here is that you take a specific model component that is expensive, for example, a parameterization scheme, and then you basically um, you learn to do the, the, the same step that the parameterization scheme is doing with the deep neural network, so with machine learning. So you just have inputs and output pairs of the parameterization scheme, and you just learn to do exactly what the parameterization scheme was doing in the first place using deep learning. And the hope is why you would do this, that you actually want to replace those parameterization schemes on the long term within your machine learning solution, uh, with your machine learning solution. And you would do this because you can, um, it, the neural network is almost guaranteed to be more efficient in terms of the computation. And also it's going to be portable. So it's very simple to port a neural network to a GPU, whereas it's very complicated to port some of those parameterization schemes to GPUs. And we have quite good um, results by now, but we really can kind of um, emulate those parameterization schemes and port them and also kind of get good results in terms of quality, but also in terms of performance. There's also an approach um, taken by uh, Jan Ackmann at the University of Oxford, where we're kind of looking into preconditioning. So um, in some of the models, we need very large to, to solve very large linear systems. And um, basically the idea is that we kind of precondition our, our linear solvers that we're using with machine learning tools. Um, and this is also kind of working quite successfully, but more details can you, you can only get if you, if you um, 
um, approach me by email. And also, finally, um, there are kind of some mapping procedures if you think about the model output. Um, where we basically learn how to to kind of um, predict uncertainty as well, not only just kind of to to improve our results in terms of model bias in comparison to the truth, but also in terms of the uncertainty presentation, in particular in what we call um, the so-called ensemble approach, where you basically learn the distributions for a specific ensemble um, using machine learning and to try to basically improve your results of ensemble predictions. And finally, um, there's one example here that I wanted to talk about, um, which is basically describing how we can use deep learning hardware um, for conventional models. So the idea here is that you have deep learning hardware, for example, the so-called tender cores from NVIDIA and Volta GPUs. And what they do is they do nothing else than half position matrix matrix multiplication. Um, and But they do this, this kind of one step extremely efficiently. So if you think about the, the peak performance, those tender cores have a, a peak performance, which is 16 times faster than if you would perform the same operations in double position on the conventional hardware. So the question is, can we actually tap on this? Can we actually use this hardware for something useful also in conventional tools? And um, <clears throat> basically the answer to this question was investigated by um, Sam Hatfield from the University of Oxford back then, but now also at Eastern WDF. And he tried to, um, to emulate those tensor cores for the most expensive kernel that we have in the model, which is a transformation between grid point and spectral space. And it turns out that you can actually use this hardware as well and get very good results in terms of forecast quality. And um, well, yes, we, we are quite certain that this would also really increase the speed of our applications as well. So these are the conclusions now. Um, um, however, I've, I kept them very general in principle, so I'm not going to read them out loud now. Um, but I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, please ask them, obviously, after the recording. But also, um, please contact me via email or Twitter or whatever. And I, yeah, thank you for your attention. OK, thank you, Peter. Um, we'll now jump into the uh, Q&A part of uh, today's Tech Take. Uh, so I'll reintroduce Dr. Peter Dubin here on, on screen. And uh, Peter, I think we have a question already, um, which I I might just read out to you, to you uh, on behalf of Paul Leopardi. And perhaps if Paul, if you want to have a bit of a follow up with this, we can um, we can get you on microphone as well. But uh, Paul asked, how is machine learning being used to estimate the statistical distributions involved in ensemble forecasting, both model and data distributions? Could the knowledge from machine learning be used to optimize ensemble processing in some way? Yeah, yeah. Hi, me in life again. Um, so yes, this is a re really a very, very good question. I actually, um, I have one slide on them, but I jumped over the slide, so I can probably just just share my screen for a second and just present the slide um, in a bit more detail. Um, so you should see my the slide that you've just seen um, a minute ago, basically uh, live now. And what you see is basically on the left, there's what we call an ensemble forecast. So in weather predictions, we often do uncertainty quantification by, whoops, uh, by actually looking into ensembles of predictions. So we have um, not only one trajectory, but a couple of them. And then we use the result on the, in the middle and on the right side, you see a distribution now for prediction instead of a single prediction. And that's very useful for weather, climate, um, weather predictions in principle to actually be able to not only give a deterministic forecast, or for example, what is going to, what this temperature going to be in Sydney in three days from now, but actually the distribution of the, of the temperature. And it turns out that um, machine learning can be used very successfully to actually improve those ensemble um, simulations. So, Instead of running a lot of ensemble members, you can also run a, a smaller number of ensemble member plus a neural network prediction. And that's something that we um, try to, um, to, to, to test uh, to get together with a group of Thorsten Höfler in, at uh, ETH in Zurich. And what we've done is we've taken a 10 member ensemble and basically only took five of those ensemble members as input to our predictions and then tried to correct for the ensemble spread and the ensemble mean um, from the 10 member ensembles using deep learning. And we get quite good results. So on the right side, you see the, the um, continuous rank probability score, which is kind of the score function of the ensemble. And the lower, the better. And you see on the right side, the E5 is a ensemble member, a ensemble with five member has a certain distribution. And then if you go to 10 members, this run is obviously going to be more expensive, but it also will bring down CRPS. But if you now only take five ensemble members plus a no network prediction, you get the green and the blue colors, and you will see that they're not only better than the five member ensemble without post-processing, but they're also even better than the 10 member ensemble because you also do a bias correction at the same time. So actually deep learning and machine learning can be used quite successfully to improve ensemble methods in principle. 
And this goes even further because um, uncertainty quantification in particular is really a very, very interesting application area for machine learning. The reason being that uncertainty quantification is inherently uncertain normally. You don't really know much, know much about the theory of uncertainty if you want in, in such very complex systems. And therefore, it's something that you can learn quite nicely. And also, if you just learn the uncertainty rather than the de deterministic signal, you can also break less. So it's also about um, uh, if, you, if you kind of have a um, um, if you have a, a, a model that is basically going as a, a solution that has a bias, for example, for a deterministic problem, then um, this bias is going to grow over time. Whereas if you have a, a bias and an uncertainty, uncertainty quantification, which is instant from a specific um, solution, for example, it's, it's not going to grow this much. So it's actually uncertainty quantification in particular, and therefore also ensemble simulations can benefit quite a lot from machine learning, I believe. So that was Thank you. One. Yeah, that was that was a uh, great question and answer there. Thank you, uh, Paul. Paul, if you if you want to follow up with that question, or please just uh, let us know. You can raise your hand. We can um, put you on mic. But we might just move on to the next question, which just popped up in the Q and A uh, while we were talking. And I'll just uh, read it on Julian's behalf uh, now. So the question is: What are the leading machine learning approaches used in ECMWF? And it seems that deep learning is dominating the work presented. Yeah, that's a good question because the question is um, where does machine learning start? Um, I mean, basically, you can argue that things like principal component analysis and these kind of things have been used over decades, right? So basically, um, the, the concept of machine learning as such is not totally new. And it's widespread that people try um, or actually extract information from data using methods, right? Um, Deep learning is a new kid on the block, if you want. Um, that in particular, the sophisticated deep learning methods are basically the, the really interesting thing to uh, explore right now and to, to look into. But we also have a lot, of um, um, uh, a lot of people looking into, for example, random forest techniques and, uh, um, for example, w for the detection of wildfires. But also, um, there's a, the tool we have for post-processing of precipitation data where we use um, uh, decision trees and the reason there is also that we can understand what the decision trees are doing so we can literally um, physically understand why the the trees are separating in the ways they do um, and, and when we could develop the so-called easy point tool so it's not only deep learning for sure not um, but at the moment deep learning is kind of on the exciting side of things uh, in particular if you kind of talk about quite sophisticated solutions with really millions of degrees of freedoms yeah, great answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question here from uh, Hilbert Van Pelt. Uh, Hilbert asks, can you elaborate, elaborate on what is required to make the current models run efficiently on GPU hardware? So, so I'm not quite sure whether this refers to the machine learning models or whether this refers to the conventional models. So for the con con um, machine learning models, it's basically the, the standard problems that you have when you run a big network on GPUs with TensorFlow and stuff like this. I mean, mostly, mostly we're running into G um, to memory and cache problems and then the efficiency is kind of going down and, and parallel training for large machine learning solutions is also still tricky. I mean, there are some solutions, but yeah, it's, it's kind of developing over time quite a bit. So there's more, more to come, I guess. For the conventional tools, um, that's a big effort. So to, I mean, I told you that we have basically um, a Fortran model normally, which is like a million lines of code. And most of this code is, is written by domain scientists, um, which doesn't mean that it's not efficient in, as such, but it means that it's kind of quite diverse from the different model components to the next and stuff like this. And to port something like this to GPU is hard work. Um, and actually, it's, it's, um, it's something we take very serious at the moment. We, we have a scalability team at ECNWF, um, which is consisting now, I think, of 15 people or so. So there are a lot of people working on making the model run more efficient and also make it more portable. And the way to go at portability right now um, for weather and climate models seems to be domain-specific languages. So there are a couple of approaches where we basically formulate domain-specific languages um, with a couple of partners in Europe and also worldwide. Um, that are fit for porting models to whatever hardware is coming in the next um, um, in, the, in the next couple of years, I guess. So basically, to heterogeneous hardware, but this is hard work. This is nothing that you can do for free. Or, um, it would be very exciting. But yeah, we are we are tackling this challenge. I would say. 
Yeah, great answer. Thank you. That actually answered, uh, uh, or just about answered some of the questions that uh, myself and my colleague were actually asking uh, in a chat here while you were talking. Um, one, one of those being, maybe you can elaborate on this, but how much of the challenges uh, are tied into the hardware versus the, de the development of the software platforms and techniques, if you had to give, give a broad answer to that? Um, that, that, that's again for machine learning more or more for the conventional hardware process? well maybe you could maybe you could explain for both it, it might be yeah. it might it could be very different answers yeah i mean for, for machine learning well, weather and climate has been a bit laid to the party right i mean we, we're not as sophisticated as a domain as other domains are in terms of large scale problems but on the other hand we have the potential to build really really large domain specific problems um like we can easily generate terabytes of data for training for example for uh, um, like examples like the parameterization scheme or um, or the, the the weather bench type the um, learning of the equation type approach that I talked about um, so we can in principle always generate a lot of data which makes it always um, capable of running on very large machines with a lot of GPU power I'm not quite sure whether we are there yet for many of those applications so we, as we kind of still in the exploration phase um, it's often a bit pointless to to put on like a thousand GPUs into a single problem if you can basically improve, get better results by changing the activation function or something like this, right? We're still, we're still a little bit in the, in the stage where we haven't done the jump yet that it actually makes sense to kind of go to petascale if you want. But um, I mean, in particular with those projects like Milestorm, we want to get ready for this. And we know that there's a lot of potential for this because we have a lot of data and you can train quite complex systems. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next two years. I would guess, I mean, most of the time, our, often our problems are a bit special in terms of, if you, in particular, if you think about global fields, you, have, you don't have too many samples, but you have very large samples. So you have a lot of data points um, in, a single, in a single sample, if you want, which makes it quite often um, difficult to fit everything into memory and GPU. So that's kind of most of the time our, our bottleneck, but that's not true for all of the applications. So if you think about the parameterization emulation that I talked briefly about, it's going to be a totally different story. Um, so it's because the, 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 the samples are smaller. It's not a global field. It's just a grid point field. So it, yeah, we, we will have all sorts of um, bottlenecks for the different applications. But what we do in Milestorm is we basically try to identify like six application areas that are quite different and also kind of spread over the workflow of, of numerical weather predictions and climate predictions. And then we basically want to have six applications that we want to really scale up in terms of complexity and understand what the requirements for them would be. So if you ask me the same question a year from now, I will probably be able to give you a better answer. But for now, it's, um, it's a lot still in the exploration phase. And for conventional tools, I mean, um, there again, it, a little bit it depends on the algorithms that you're working with. So um, for example, at, at ECWF, we're working with a spectral model. So we basically have a grid point representation of the physical fields, but we also have a spectral representation and we kind of need to go from one to the other and back again during a time step. And this um, transformation takes a lot of communication and actually also global communication, which is basically the bottleneck. But then it also allows us to use semi-implicit time stepping schemes very efficiently. So therefore, we are going to have very long time steps and are going to be quite fast in the time step. For other models like grid point models with explicit or semi-implicit time stepping schemes, the story is different. Then you have basically a typical stencil problem if you want very similar to CFD type problems, but then you can only work with very short time scales and uh, time steps, and then you're also kind of going to be a bit slowish. So in principle, I think um, we're not doing, we're not making very good use of the current hardware in terms of peak performance, um, but the network and the, the communication is really key and we should probably go more towards data-driven um, performance analysis rather than flop driven performance analysis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. That was great too. Uh, actually getting a few more questions in now, which is, is great to see here. Um, if, uh, yeah, if anyone has a question, either drop it into the Q and A uh, section on Zoom or just raise your hand in the chat and we can uh, get you a microphone. It's totally up to you. Um, uh, ben Evans has a question here. He mentioned it was an excellent talk and uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the slides at some point and perhaps we can discuss that. Uh, yeah, that'll be yeah. fine. Um, he also asked, uh, will, you, will you be releasing your training data sets? That's a good question. I mean, that, that very much depends on um, what problem you're talking about. But generally, I'm a strong believer in open data sets and I'm a strong believer in what we call benchmark data sets. So, um, I mean, you've seen the example where we basically try to just, the first example that I gave you when we try to predict the weather just based on a machine learning tool. 
And for this one, for example, we have published a data set called WeatherBench, which we really wanted to make a benchmark test because we were seeing that several groups were looking into the problem with their own data set and you couldn't really compare the results, which is a pity. So we actually deliberately kind of put together a, a benchmark data set um, that everyone could be using to kind of explore, the, to compare the different machine learning solutions um, qualitatively and also quantitatively against each other. So yes, we have a very um, strong, um, strong motivation to, to publish those data sets. And I think all the papers that we have published so far, we also always have published the data set with a, with a paper. Um, and we also going to do this within the milestone project. So for all, all those application areas, the idea is also to publish the data set, not only for machine learning scientists to actually improve on the solutions, but also in terms of a hardware benchmark um, that people can actually also do hardware benchmarking with those. But um, that's still, yeah, the, the, the first data sets are to be published there in like four months to come or something like this. So it's, it's still a bit um, early in the process. Um, for some of the data set, it's more tricky. If you, for example, have observational data that we use at Eastern WF, we cannot just open them publicly available because it's not our data. We're using the data, but we're not, we're not, we do not own the data. So it's not always, always this, this, this is easy. Sure. Yeah. So maybe in the next, uh, yeah, four, four, four months or so, we might see, uh, might see those like you were saying. Uh, thank you. Um, Justin Freeman uh, has a, a quite a long question here, so I'll do my best to read it out without tripping over my words. Uh, Hi, Peter. How can we scale uh, slash adapt neural network architectures? I am thinking about convolutional neural nets. NWP data, for example, is big, lots of vertical levels, high spatial dimensions, and high frequency temporal information. The ERA-5 example in your presentation used a small part of a single vertical level. So can we train a model that takes in the full 80 levels of ERA-5 with global coverage, or do we wait until 2031? Yeah, that is a, um, a million dollar question. I, I don't know the answer to this one. Um, so it is, um, I mean, if you can, if you do this, I mean, this is basically referring against to this kind of weather bench example where you learn the equations from, from the analysis data. So you have a, a lot of data about the atmosphere and you just learn the equations of motion really to look into the future. So you basically build a model just straight from the data. And there are different ways to do this. So you can assume that this is going to be a global data pattern like we do with like one or two fields or maybe 10 fields or something like this. But then you have a lot of data because the sample is very large. Um, so training from this is quite painful, um, but then you can also assume that you're local. You cannot, you could literally just cut out an area around the point that you want to update, for example. Um, then you, you're going to be less effective in terms of convolutions and encoding, decoding, and scale interaction representation and these kind of things. But but you may be it may be easier to actually learn from the data, and you have more independent data sample that you could train from. So. It's yeah. I, I don't. I don't know a good. I, I don't have a good. Even even though I've thought about this problem quite a long time, I don't have a good answer to this one. Which means that there's probably a lot to investigate and study uh, in research projects. But perhaps something that it's it's not not in the near future, but perhaps something uh, down down the road. Uh, it probably also thinking about it, it probably also depends on the forecast lead time you're interested in. So if you're interested in very short term predictions, you probably only need information locally. So you can richly zoom in and just take a local domain cut out. Um, if you're interested in very long term predictions, you want to have basically global coverage and then um, cutting out the local area doesn't go though so well. Um, so it basically, it also depends on, on what, you, what you're targeting at, 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 I guess. If you're talk, talking about seasonal prediction, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you should have the global domain and CNNs and stuff like this too do the interactions. If you're talking about short-term prediction, I'm sure you'll be fine with a very small area. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, w, w. Lu has a question, uh, short, much shorter question. Uh, what programming languages and libraries are you using? Ah, um, for machine learning, like for, that's, that's kind of also the, the funny bit. The domain scientists really are working with Fortran and we're now basically trying to embrace Fortran as well with domain specific languages and these kind of approaches. So um, this is a sm slow moving field with a lot of legacy code. Um, I mean, there are now approaches to basically go to languages just such as Julia, um, but they are slow, slowly moving. And on the other hand, you have machine learning scientists working with machine learning tools. So we have basically the, 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 the normal standard um, Jupyter notebooks, Python codes. Um, you have the, the, the standard um, machine learning libraries like PyTorch, Torch, and TensorFlow, and all these kind of things. Um, so it's basically whatever is normal in the two worlds we are using. And the 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 
the, the problem is more like to bring those two together and basically make Fortran users aware that they should be coding with Python if they want to do machine learning and also make machine learning aware, users aware that it may not be so easy to just kind of um, call TensorFlow from a Fortran code and that they need that there will be some solutions required and so on and so forth. Thank you. Um, looks like we've got a, another question here from Hilbert Van Pelt. Um, we've got about another eight, eight or so minutes here. So uh, we'll be wrapping this up shortly. If anyone has any more questions, uh, please pop them in in the meantime, but uh, we'll answer Hilbert's uh, question here while we still have time. Uh, most data points you have, you will have will be data will be, sorry, let me start again. Most data points you will, ha will have will be point data while the traditional models will have a large number of data points and volumes. What are your thoughts on distributing the influence of the data points through the volume? Also a copy of the slides would be great and thanks for the great talk. I'm not 100% sure whether I understand the question correctly. What I think you are saying, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that you often have um, observations on points, whereas you have in models fields that are represented on, on grid cells. So it's basically like a large volume of, of air or water or whatever you're looking into at the moment. And um, this is not always going very well together. So if you kind of just go outside and make a temperature measurement, and then you want to compare it to your measurement within the model, for example, it's not the same thing. It's just the, the one is a point measurement and the other one is a, is a measurement of a grid box of, let's say, 10 times 10, kilome 10, 10, 10 times 10 kilometer, which can be different, right? In terms of variability and everything. Um, what we do to make them work together is actually um, that we um, have so-called uh, observation operators. So we basically try to do a mapping procedure from ob the observations into the model world and back again. And um, their machine learning can be really very, very interesting. So it's something that we haven't explored in respect to deep learning yet, but we want to. Um, but it's basically a nonlinear mapping where you don't really have a physical intuition how it should really look like. Um, and therefore, like using machine learning for observation operators to make this transition between um, grid point observations, for example, and a, a mesh grid and a, in, a, in a numerical weather prediction model with machine learning seems to be very interesting and we're looking forward to explore this a bit more. Sure, thank you. Um, that looks like it's all the questions for now. Um, so uh, in lieu of any other questions, um, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Peter Dubin uh, very much for being part of the Tech Take today. I know it's still uh, quite early there uh, on the other side of the planet. So yeah, very much appreciated for uh, joining us for our, uh, just our second Tech Take uh, today. Um, what I might do, Peter, if, if, if we do have permission to share your slides, I might uh, go ahead and, and send a link to uh, our registered attendees from today. Uh, on where to get Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. So we'll definitely sort that out. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it, everyone. Uh, I did want to mention that our next Tech Take, uh, that'll be Tech Take number three, will be coming up uh, on Tuesday, the 29th of June. That'll be at 11 a.m. AEST. Uh, and we don't have anyone lined up for that currently, but we will, we will do shortly and we'll be announcing more information on that in the coming weeks. Uh, so if you're interested in, in listening to any more of these Tech Tech series, uh, please make sure you register for those and uh, we'll have those, yeah, like I said, the last Tuesday of every month uh, throughout the year. Uh, so once again, uh, Peter, thank you very much. Um, everyone have a good afternoon or a good morning wherever you are and uh, we'll hopefully see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.